the fact that you have two basic neurotransmitter systems in upstairs in this in this functional brain, more or less functional brain, uh, that has that one is a, is a, is a one is a serotonin tryptamine thing, and one is a, a norepinephrine or dopamine like uh, phenethylamine. And it turned out, as I was exploring more and more new compounds related to these neurotransmitters and making them, proving their, their, their structural integrity, their purity, and tasting them and finding out their activity, uh, the whole families were phenethylamines and tryptamines. They were the same worlds as, as the neurotransmitters. One of these little coincidences. Also found out that such things as DMT, which is one of the more interesting of the tryptamine uh, psychedelics, is a natural material in the body. Uh, it's in the in central nervous system. So technically, if the authorities wish to, to become real pushy, we are all subject to arrest for being transporters of a Schedule One drug. Because <laughs> it's in the spinal column. It's in, uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> well, that would be a, a defense I'm sure the government would cover. But, uh, <laughs> um, but we, and another thing that I found to be an interesting little tidbit on this was that the DMT, when you have taken the experience, with most psychedelics, you try to repeat it or follow it up a little with a, with a follow-up, you become a little bit immunized to its effect. You become a little bit um, less responsive. With DMT, not at all. So I feel the DMT is in the brain and in the spinal system, in the, in the uh, neurological system, of the, of the, as playing some role. And since it plays a normal role there, the body does not become uh, tolerant to it. It, it keeps its, its activity full, full amount. Uh, so again, what is, what is it doing in the 5-methoxy-DMT? It's, it's in there as a natural component inside of us. I'm wondering if many of the neurotransmitters, if taken under certain circumstances, would be psychedelics. Do we indeed have psychedelics in us for a reason? Um, uh, Terence... Uh, McKenna went into a beautiful direction in this on the on the argument that maybe the uh, the psilocybe family, the the mushroom family, uh, could have been used by early early man to be able to see more accurately, see the distance, to be able to see down there. Oh, there's where tonight's dinner is. Whereas the other people who did not have this these visual acute this visual acuity would not have had that quite that survival value of knowing where dinner is coming from. And I told him about a study that had been done in in um, Ohio years and years ago in which uh, the, uh, this very neat fellow who did a lot of work in humans with, with psilocybin, psilocin, uh, gave uh, a, 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 developed some sort of a, a projector that would have and cut out the bottom 10% of the bottom 10, 20% of the, of the typing of a text. So you have a, a written text of which you can only see 80% of it or 70% of it. And he'd eclipse more and more of it to find out which point a person cannot understand what he's reading because he's not seeing enough of the letters to know what the words are. And so he got this thing and he found, here's a, here's a, this guy's a 28%er, this guy's a 32%er. Gave them psilocybin. And under the influence of the psilocybin, they became much more able to read what was not there. And with a great deal of accuracy. Hmm. And, uh, it's weird. and it was, as the drug dropped off, they've lost the, the ability to, to see what was being eclipsed. So the idea of, uh, of Terence's argument of seeing in things that are not normally visible because of this would be a, well, of course, on the other hand, uh, if you could see things of such beauty, uh, you'd see your reflection on the, on the beautiful tooth of a saber-toothed tiger, and you may not be part of the gene pool later. On. <laughs> so there, there may, be, may be negatives of being responsive to endogenous psychedelics, but I believe they are in there in quite a bit of number, and we've learned to live with them. And um, how much more? Shagun, should we go on? People who have been here have all, we've all been talking about the effect of psychedelic drugs as if it were a single drug. But every drug is individual. Every drug has its own property, its own type of action. I've come across some rather fascinating potent compounds that are absolutely ugly in their, in their psychedelic effects. Uh, one, one I remember I, I uh, unraveled a little bit of was, uh, I think it was diacetropyl tryptamine, in which the only effect it had was not on the visual but on the auditory. <laughs> and it made everything totally out of tune. Uh, I, some little careful work was done with that particular compound by some allies who are not publicly known, uh, in which they used two forms of music sources. One was a, an oscilloscope, a, a, a sine wave generator, and the other was hitting the key on the, on the piano. And have the people who have perfect pitch, the one of the requirements for their two students, for their students, was they have perfect pitch. 
and they'd hit the note on the piano and it would come out such and such and they call the shot correctly and as the uh, <coughs> experiment developed and, the, and, the, exper and the, the drug came on they, they were going off more and more on the identification of what the pitch was there the, the pitch was too low and the pitch was, but the beauty of it, it was not a, a too lowness as, as a 10% or 20%. It was too lowness in that the, each frequency of a complex waveform would go down by the same number of cycles. And hence, the, the, you play an oboe on, on this machine, and it no longer sounds like an oboe, because all the harmonics are out of pitch with one another, no longer harmonically related. Mm. It's just ugly music. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but there's no visual. I mean, there's, here's something... I mean, if you, if you have a, a patient, let's say you have a, a patient uh, and you want to do an experiment and the patient hears, hears God and he talks to God all the time. He, that's, he's a little bit perhaps on the schizophrenic side, but that's we have to determine. He does talk with God, but he has a voice. The voice is heard. He hears this voice. And is, it, is there an area in the brain that is uniquely uh, dedicated to the pitch of sound and when the pitch, and that's where this drug happens to go, maybe you could identify uh, the nature of the sound structure on the basis of that. No visuals, but this auditory change is very real and it's very consistent. I was talking to a person over in a year or two over in Marin County, he said, how could we use animals to study this? <laughs> and the answer, I think, is very simple. I think there are anim birds, for example, that all have about the same call, but there are different pitches. And this pitch attracts those over there, this pitch attracts those over yonder, and the breeding patterns are established by the nature of the call. Not the, it's clearly, it's a, that's the right bird. But this little group of birds has a pitch of its own. Give these birds some things and see they mess up their mating patterns. There are all kinds of things that can be done <laughs> using animal studies where you don't have to call upon using an animal as a, as a, uh, a, a tool in a psychedelic study, but as a way of being able to trace where in the, in the, in the, in the head these things go. It would be simple to make the compound, that diisopropyl compound, a little bit of carbon-11, and put it in a person who hears voices and see if it goes to a specific place in the, in the, in the brain. And that place might be labeled by, the, by, the, by radio assay of a, a, a scanning uh, device of where distribution is.